Hi, welcome to another short video where I'm gonna walk you through AWS Certified Cloud Practitioner exam questions. So what I'm doing here is kind of walking you through just to give you an idea of the types of questions you might encounter on the Cloud Practitioner exam and also my thought process when answering them. And these all come from our question bank where we've recently refreshed the whole bank and added lots and lots of new questions. So the first question asks, what advantages do you get from using the AWS Cloud? So you'll find on the Cloud Practitioner, there are a lot of questions that are asking you about the advantages of the cloud, the various benefits you might get as an organization if you move to the AWS Cloud. So you really need to understand those benefits for the exam. So let's have a look through these answers. And again, we've got to choose two. So firstly, it's trade capital expense for a variable expense. So you may remember that with the cloud, what we're doing is we're paying on a monthly basis. So we're paying a monthly bill, and that would be termed as an operational expenditure by an accountant or OPEX. And so that bill is then based on the amount of usage. So if you use lots of S3 storage and you have lots of RDS databases running, you're gonna pay more than another month where you decrease the amount of services you're using. So it is a variable expense and it's not a capital expense because with capital, it means you're purchasing something upfront like you're buying a physical server or you're buying a storage server or something like that. So the first answer looks correct and I'm gonna check that one. So the next one is stop guessing about capacity. Now this has come up a couple of times in our videos. It is something you really need to understand. So firstly, on the whole, you're not guessing about capacity, um, but there are some instances where you kind of are making capacity decisions, but it's generally a lot less committing than if, for instance, you're buying um, you know, $100,000 worth of physical infrastructure um, that you then find that you don't need. So stop guessing about capacity is a benefit of the cloud. But remember, there can be some nuances to this where, for instance, you need to make no capacity decisions with AWS Lambda, but you need to choose your instance type with EC2. So there are sometimes some levels of decision that you have to make around capacity. The next answer is increased capital expenditure. Well, as we mentioned before, the cloud is about operational expenditure. So it's about a sort of monthly variable cost rather than a big bill up front from when you purchase something. So I don't think that's a good answer. Next up, we have gain greater control of the infrastructure layer. Well, with the infrastructure layer, we're more talking about the underlying platform that AWS services run on. So you might think of that as the servers and the hypervisors, so the software that runs on them for the virtualization. It could also mean the services such as the cloud controller layer and the interfaces that you use to actually provision and launch your services. And that's not something you have control over. That's more something that AWS control. And lastly, comply with all local security compliance programs. Well, AWS do have a lot of compliance programs that they, they do adhere with. They've got lots of certifications and attestations and so on, but maybe not all of them. So if in your region, wherever you are in the world, you may find that they don't necessarily have a particular security certification that you might need for your data. So that's not really an advantage of the cloud. Let's click on check. And sure enough, those are the correct answers. And we've got a bit more information here and the six advantages of cloud come up. So make sure you know these for the exam. We've got trade capital expense for variable expense, benefit from massive economies of scale. So that's about AWS purchasing lots of hardware and software and therefore reducing the cost to you as someone who consumes it. Stop guessing about capacity, which we've talked about a lot speed and agility, which we spoke about in a previous video, and stop spending money on running and maintaining data centers. So that means you don't have to manage the data center because remember that's the AWS responsibility. And go global in minutes so you can launch your services all over the world very quickly. So make sure you remember the six advantages before you go to the exam. And let's click on next. This question asks, which configuration changes are associated with scaling horizontally? So there's two different ways that you scale. You scale vertically and you scale horizontally. So let's just think before we start looking at the answers at what is vertical and what is horizontal. So vertical, for example, is where you have an EC2 instance and it's running out of CPU and memory. Your application is using lots of CPU and memory. So what do you have to do? Well, you have to change the instance size. If you change the instance size, you're scaling up or vertically. 
Now, another way you can scale is horizontally. So in the same example, if you had an auto scaling group, rather than changing your instance type so it's got more CPU and memory, you just add another instance. So now you've got more CPU and memory because you have another EC2 instance. And that's an example of horizontal scaling. So let's look at the answers. Adding additional EC2 instances through auto scaling. So I just spoke about that. So to me, that's definitely horizontal scaling. Adding a larger capacity hard drive to a server. So the disk is run out of storage space or the volume that's attached to it. And so you need to change that to a larger capacity. Well, to me, that's vertical scaling. So that's not a correct answer. Changing the DB instance class on an RDS DB. So we're talking about an Amazon relational database service database. Now, again, this is where you need to remember which services are based on EC2 instances. I mean, it tells you here anyway, because you're changing the instance class. So you're changing which instance type you're using. So you're moving from one maybe that's got less CPU and RAM to one that's got more. So that's vertical scaling. We then got adding additional hard drives to a storage array. So think of this as you're not increasing the size of the disk, but you're adding more disks. So compared to EC2, EC2 we said that we were changing the instance type and that would be vertical scaling so that you have more CPU and memory. Or we said that you could scale horizontally by putting it in an auto scaling group and then you have um, additional instances being launched. Well, this is analogous to what we're talking about here. So rather than changing to a bigger volume or a bigger hard drive, you add additional hard drives. So that's horizontal scaling. So I think that's a correct answer. And lastly, we have changing an EC2 instance to a type that's got more CPU and RAM. So we've talked about that a lot. So that's not a correct answer because that's vertical scaling. Let's click on check. And sure enough, those are the correct answers. So let's move on. This question asks, what features does Amazon RDS provide to deliver scalability, availability, and durability? And you've got to choose two. So RDS, again, is the relational database service. So that's a database which you can choose a few different engines, for instance, MySQL, MariaDB, and Microsoft SQL. So you can choose your engine. And how do we make this scalable, available, and durable? Now, the first thing you've got to understand here is we're not talking about a database that you control on an EC2 instance. If you install a EC2 instance and you install a database on it, you've got a bit more flexibility in various different availability models. And so going through these answers here, I'm gonna miss the top two there, and we'll come back to those in a second. But DB mirroring, so that's where you, you, know, you basically mirror the contents of one hard drive or volume onto another one. And that's not something that you're going to be able to do in RDS, but you could do that if you had your instance uh, running on EC2. And we then have clustering. So clustering is where you cluster multiple servers and run a database on them so that if one fails, the other one still continues to service requests. So again, that's not something you can do with RDS. And lastly there, we've got multi-subnet. Well, you can't really create an RDS instance that's multi-subnet. And the reason is because the terminology that you should be looking for is the top one there. So multi-AZ. So that means multiple availability zones. Now, a quick sort of thing that you need to remember is that subnets are mapped to availability zones. So you create a subnet in an availability zone, but you can have multiple subnets in an availability zone. So that means that if you try to create redundancy by splitting things between different subnets, You've got to make sure that they're sitting on different availability zones. Otherwise, you don't have that level of high availability and redundancy in case something fails. But multi-AZ is what RDS gives you, and that means it creates a standby copy of the database in another availability zone. And that has synchronous replication, and you can fail over to the standby instance if you need to. And then the next way that you can scale your database is using a read replica. Now, there's two ways that you scale RDS. One is you scale vertically, and you need to do that for database writes. So let's say that your database experiences a lot of write traffic, so you're writing records to the database. For that, if you need to, if you run out of resources, you change the instance type, so you have more CPU and memory. That's vertical scaling. Now, another way you can scale is horizontally. So that means, and this is used when you have lots of reads. So lots of queries are happening on your database. So you're, you're trying to query information rather than write information. 
In that case, you can use a read replica, which is a copy of the database. And that copy only serves reads, not writes. And it uses asynchronous replication from RDS, from the master database. So read replicas is a correct answer. Let's click on check. Sure enough, those are correct. And here's a nice diagram which shows you a master database here. And then you have a standby. So that's multi-AZ. So these are two different availability zones. And you have a standby server here. It's doing synchronous replication and you can fail over to it when you need to. And then you have a read replica. And that could be in another availability zone or the same AZ. And you can direct reads to the replica and reads and writes to the master. So let's move on. Which of the statements below is accurate regarding S3 buckets? Okay, so you need to know quite a bit about S3 if you're gonna be working with AWS and also for the Cloud Practitioner exam. So we've got to choose two answers. So firstly, it says bucket names must be unique regionally. Well, what you need to know is that bucket names are unique globally. When you create buckets and objects in S3, you'll find that there's a URL. And so being a URL, it needs to be unique on the internet. And that's how you access your data. So bucket names must be unique globally, not regionally. Buckets are replicated globally. Well, that's not true either. So you actually create your bucket in a region. So it's a global namespace, but you create the bucket in a region. And that means that your data is within that region and actually never gets replicated out of that region unless you explicitly configure replication. So that's not true either. Bucket names must be unique globally. We just mentioned that, so that's true. Buckets are region specific. So make sure you understand that difference there. So you create the bucket in a region, but the name has to be unique globally. You've got to remember that one. And you'll do this for latency reasons as well. So you might keep your data in a region where it's closest to your users to reduce the amount of latency or delay on the line, on the network connecting to that data. So that looks like a correct answer. Next up, we have buckets can contain other buckets. Well, that's not true. So AWS S3 or Amazon S3 is what's called a flat namespace. And you can create a bucket and then you put your objects in that bucket. But you can't create a bucket within another bucket. So it's not like a file system like EFS or a file system that you create on a block storage system like EBS. In those, you can create directories or folders and create folders within folders and create your hierarchical structure. But you can't do that with Amazon S3. So that's not true either. So I'm pretty happy with these two answers. So that's true. And let's move on. This question says, which of the following are AWS recommended best practices in relation to the Identity and Access Management Service, IAM? Now, by the way, sometimes the acronyms will be broken out for you. So it will say Identity and Access Management. Other times in the exam, it just says IAM or SNS or SQS. So you've got to know them um, because you never know when they're going to try and trick you by uh, you know, giving a correct or incorrect answer and sort of abbreviating it rather than showing you the full, um, full name because that might give you a clue. So what are best practices for IAM? Assign permissions to users. Well, that would mean that you're applying, for instance, a policy which has permissions assigned to it. So you write your permissions in a policy and you assign that policy to the users. Now, that's not a best practice. You should assign your permissions to groups and then you put users in groups. So if you have lots of people who work in uh, some kind of support role and they need specific permissions, you create a policy, write out the permissions in it, and then you attach that to a group and you put all your support users in the group and then they all have the same permissions. Much easier to manage. Create individual IAM users. Well, what this means is you're actually creating individual users for people rather than sharing an account. So AWS will always say don't share accounts because you know you can't audit very well if you, people are sharing accounts and you don't know who actually performed an action, that kind of thing. So I believe that's definitely a best practice. The next one is embed access keys in application code. So remember that there's an access key ID and a secret access key. And these are what you can use to access AWS programmatically. So you can authenticate to AWS and configure services programmatically. Now, you shouldn't install these on code or you shouldn't store them in code. You should always try to avoid that. And usually that would use uh, mean using roles, so IAM roles, rather than storing the, code, the uh, sensitive information in the code. So that's not a best practice. Next is enable multi-factor authentication for all users, MFA. Now, 
AWS used to recommend enable MFA for privileged users. Now they've kind of changed it and they pretty much just say enable MFA. So they would like you to have it for all users. That might not be practical, depends on your organization, but that is the best practice. And then lastly, grant greatest privilege. So this is the opposite of least privilege and least privilege is what you should remember because that's what you need to do. You need to give people the minimum permissions they need to be able to perform their job or role in the company. So you never wanna give people more than they need. So that would be least privilege. Uh, greatest privilege is definitely wrong. So let's click on check. And sure enough, that is the correct answer. And now we've got what considerations are there when choosing which region to use. Now I can spot one of the correct answers straight away. And we actually talked about it a few minutes ago. So you'll remember that I mentioned that with Amazon S3, for instance, you create your buckets in a region and sometimes you have people in different regions and you might wanna store your data closer to those users. And that's because of latency. So latency is the delay over a network when you're connecting to an application or, or retrieving some data or anything like that. So the further away you are, typically the, the greater delay that you potentially have. So latency is definitely a reason, reason why you might choose to use a specific region. So I'm gonna go for that one. The other one that stands out to me here is data sovereignty. Now, in many countries, you'll find there are requirements on organizations to store data within the country itself and not to move that data out. For example, it could be human resources records, um, it could be personal information of some sort, and the government mandates that you're not allowed to move that outside of the country. So data sovereignty is definitely a good reason because again, with S3 as an example, you store it within a particular region. And that means that that data never leaves that region unless you explicitly create a replication policy to replicate it. So I've arrived at those answers. They did sort of jump out at me. Now let's look at the other three. Available storage capacity. Would you worry about that? Is that why you would choose one region over another? Well, you shouldn't do because AWS, you know, in most services, they'll just say that they scale to whatever capacity you need. So that's not a reason. Pricing in local currency. Well, AWS prices in US dollars. That's it. It doesn't matter where you are. It's always US dollars. And lastly, available compute capacity. So again, it's kind of saying that perhaps you would choose a region because you're worried there's not enough compute capacity in one region versus another. And generally, that's not going to be the case unless you have some really massive requirements, in which case you might try and reserve capacity in advance. So I think those are the two correct answers. Let's click on check. And what do you know? They are the correct answers. And the next question is, you need to ensure you have the right amount of compute available to service demand. Which service can automatically scale the number of EC2 instances for your application? So the first one is Elastic Load Balancer. Now, you remember I mentioned in a previous video that you've got two things that you need to do if you're scaling EC2. Firstly, you need to add more instances. So the only way that you're going to automatically scale EC2 is by adding instances because changing the, uh, the instance type, that's not going to be something that you do automatically. You might have to have some sort of manual intervention on that if you need more CPU and RAM. But instead, you would typically add more instances depending what type of application you have. But then once you've added those instances, you need to direct traffic to them. So for that, you use a load balancer like an Amazon ELB. So Again, the answer that jumps out is that we're scaling the number of instances. It's not about directing traffic to them. So I'm gonna go with auto scaling. We then got the elastic load balancer. That's how you would direct traffic to those instances. So that's not how you scale the instances. Elastic cache is an in-memory database. So that's not about scaling EC2. It's about scaling perhaps read for your database so that you can cache some data in memory. And then Redshift is a data warehouse. So it's about data analytics. So that's not gonna be about scaling EC2. So let's click on check. And sure enough, that is the correct answer. So that's the end of this video. I hope you enjoyed it and I wish you the best of luck in your exams.